everyone! So recently I was invited to go to Paris to view an exhibition called Picasso Punitif at Musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac. I apologize in advance for my very terrible French. If you saw my previous video on Picasso and his muses, you can probably guess that I was pretty stoked to go, regardless of what you think of the man or the artist himself, whether you like his art or not, it's hard to deny that he is perhaps one of the most influential, most prolific, and most important artists of the past 100 years. The show is the first of its kind, a collaboration with Musée Picasso, to explore the development of Picasso's work, which are shown right alongside with indigenous, non-Western art. It was certainly very eye-opening, and I want to share with you what I've learned. To give you a background on the museum itself, it's a fairly new museum in a city of legendary museums like the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay. It's only about 11 years old and it's right next to the Eiffel Tower. In fact, you get a lovely view from the rooftop restaurant. It's this massive red contemporary structure that is quite the contrast from its Osmanian neighbors with which it shares its walls. Inside, you'll find its massive permanent collection, which showcases the objects and art of Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. While the outside is open and bright with a lush garden, the interior is dark with winding pathways and spotlights to highlight the objects. In part, this helps conserve certain objects that were made without the intention of lasting very long, but it also creates this sort of mystery about these foreign objects. I want to take a pause here to discuss a couple of things. In particular, I want to talk about what it means for this non-Western museum to be showcasing the work of a European man and his interaction with non-Western Art. It's an incredibly complicated situation, but I actually think the museum and the exhibition takes great care to address this. To give you a little refresher, during the early 1900s, when much of this work was made, France, along with a number of other European countries, had already been busy building one of the largest colonial empires for the last 400 plus years. It was basically a race to see which country could get the most land around the world for, of course, the prestige, but also to control key trading routes, land, and raw materials. It was also seen as sort of this moral mission to lift these primitive peoples by giving them a more sophisticated language, culture, and guiding them to the light of Catholic religion. Jules Ferry, the leading proponent of colonialism, declared, The higher races have a right over the lower races. They have a duty to civilize the inferior races. Now we can see how there's already a lot of problems here. First of all, with the use of words like primitive, inferior, even the use of the word non-Western, which casts Western as the norm. It's a very European-centric perspective. Now there was a great interest on the part of France to show off all the great work that they've been doing for the world, so there was a number of occasions where objects from these places were brought to Paris for exhibition. In fact, if you look into the history of the collection of this museum, it comes from mainly three sources. One is the Musée de l'Homme, or the Museum of Man, which is an interesting name, and that is the descendant of the Musée de Ethnographique du, du Trocadero. Oh, I don't know how to say anything. Trocadero. Found in 1878, which had been built for the third Paris World's Fair the same year. That's the fair where major countries came to showcase their new technologies like Alexander Graham Bell's telephone and Thomas Edison's megaphone and phonograph. But it also had a very popular human zoo called the Negro Village comprised of 4,000 indigenous people. So you can tell from that the attitude towards these people was kind of terrible, really. like. Awful, just awful, quite literally turning them into circus acts. Come see these primitive and exotic people from the past. Mm. 
The second major part of the collection comes from the National Museum of Arts of Africa and Oceania, which began as the Colonial Exhibition of 1931, and that was an attempt to show off the diverse cultures and resources of France's colonial possessions to highlight how their relationship with their colonies was mutually beneficial, and then really downplaying the claims of them assimilating these colonial societies. A lot of these objects, including ones in the museum's collection today, we have no idea of how they were acquired. Um, and there's just no way of figuring that out. We can tell that this specific carving is from Mali by a Dogon artist based on style or materials or subject, but there's no signature to tell who this specific artist is or why they created it or how it became acquired by the French. It could have been bought or taken. They could have been traded with someone who stole it from someone else. There was a huge demand for these objects in Europe and many people, including modern artists like Picasso, acquired them on the cheap. In fact, in the early 2000s, New Zealand's National Museum, the Te Papa, made it their mission to reacquire Maori remains held in various institutions around the world. One of the objects in question were the Momomokai, or the Maori tattooed heads held in the Kaibranli, and the objects were formally returned to New Zealand in 2012. It's a very tricky landscape to navigate. What right do museums have to possess these objects or to even show these objects? For example, some of these objects are made for rituals. They're not made to be preserved. They're made for maybe an initiation ceremony where only the older men and the young boys are allowed to see the objects. Women weren't allowed to see certain things. What does it mean for the museum to be showing this to anyone who comes in. In some cases, these groups of people no longer even exist. During the tour of its permanent collection, I was really struck by the amount of sensitivity needed to work in this space. There is a sense of responsibility to preserve history and knowledge of these cultures that are no longer existing or quickly declining, but also a great joy in sharing the limited knowledge that was very difficult to acquire trying to understand how these various people live, how they think about the world, their religion and virtues. It's important to understand their original context, but to also consider it in its current situation. Are these objects art or artifacts? The third major source for this collection are newly acquired objects, and thankfully today there's a lot less shadiness. They're much better documented and there's more of a process. But especially when it comes to large institutions like this, they're a lot more thorough and sensitive and selective in this process. That being said, the museum in Trocadero was very popular among modern artists, including the man in question today, Pablo Picasso. While it's extremely easy to go down this path to talk about cultural appropriation and discuss the visual similarities between Picasso's work and non-Western art, the show, however, takes a very interesting approach. The exhibition is split into two categories that approaches the relationship from two different ways. The first is chronological and follows key times in which Picasso comes into contact with non-Western art. Many of these objects are actually on display, like the first object he acquired, a tiki from the Marquesas Island, and the Nivembomba body mask, a gift from Matisse, which Picasso refused to take until Matisse's death in 1954. After Picasso's visit to the Trocadero Museum, he apparently reworked his famous Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. The faces of these women are often compared to African masks. He is quoted by Françoise Julot in Life with Picasso, saying, When I went for the first time to the Chaco de Ho Museum, I stayed and studied. Men had made these masks and other objects for a sacred purpose, a magic purpose, as a kind of mediation between themselves and the unknown hostile forces that surround them, in order to overcome their fear and horror by giving it a form and an image. At that moment, I realized that this was what painting was all about. 
painting isn't an aesthetic operation. It is a form of power by giving form to our terrors as well as our desires. When I came to that realization, I knew I had found my way. A big argument of this show is that Picasso was not simply visually inspired by these objects. In fact, he had said that he wasn't even aware of Negro art, the term used to refer to objects that were not just African, but basically anything that wasn't European or Asian. He wasn't interested in the exoticism of these objects and instead identified with these works as equal works of art that spoke to him deeply. The second part of the exhibition approaches this by exploring the similarities in stylization and themes, first through archetypal body positions like nudity, verticality of the human form, and the simplification of the body into sign. In Metamorphosis, they compare Picasso's interest in images containing other images, recursive imagery, and the use of animal human forms like the Minotaur, which was often used by Picasso to represent himself. They also show how he started to create assemblages from found objects, a technique often used by non-Western works. In the third and final category, id, they discuss the primal nature shared between these works, the importance of urges and instinct. He was fascinated with the gaze, the face, mouth, and genitalia as he abstracted and distorted them. They become especially gruesome during times of war and when the artist struggled with loss. The objects were placed in a way where sometimes it's hard to tell which works are Picasso and which were made by unknown artists, placing them on the same level of art. Picasso felt there was something about these objects that were truly at the core of the human experience. Photographs show that he had collected and kept these objects intermingled with his work throughout his studio, and quotes show his admiration, respect, and even fear of the power of these objects. The title, Picasso Primitif, isn't just a nod to the weight of the term in art history, but rather refers to that initial, deepest, and most fundamental part of the human experience, which is understood by all. And this, they argue, is what Picasso deeply identified with in these non-Western objects. It was through conversations with these objects that Picasso was able to break free from formal Western approaches and change the course of modern art. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please do me a huge favor by giving it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel, Little Art Talks. If you wanna keep riding that Picasso train, I do have another video that covers Picasso and his various muses, his lovers, his women, his wives, things like that. A huge, huge thank you to the museum Kai Bon Lee. Uh, I apologize for my French again, but they were amazing. It was such a good tour. I had such a great time and the tour was just spot on. If you are in Paris or visiting Paris this summer, you should definitely go visit. Picasso Primitif will be up until July 23rd, 2017. So I hope you guys will have a chance to check it out. And if you missed the show, they have other wonderful exhibitions. The permanent collection is also fantastic. So I hope you'll have a chance to check it out. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.